In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. I haven't seen you yet. Happy New Year. Uh, the New Year, so happy, happy New Year, too. It's really uh, wonderful and good to be with you today. For reasons I think you will soon see, or I hope you will soon see as the sermon unfolds, I have been reflecting a lot this week about the stories of our lives and the ways we tell it, the signs we use to proclaim it. We do this uh, in all kinds of ways, of course, in physical, tangible ways. Many of our bodies bear scars, a sign of a deeper story. Perhaps it was a trauma that was inflicted upon you or an accident you never saw coming. Perhaps it was a childhood mishap or some silly mistake you made in the stupor of having a newborn when you cut your hand with a bread knife. Not that I have done that before. Or <laughs> some among us mark important moments or experiences or people in our lives with tattoos, telling the stories of people and places that have changed us. Each of us, no doubt, bear the markings of heartbreak or grief, of emotional trauma or suffering, of moments of joy on our hearts. And each of us, at least I think I can assume by our presence here, bear the markings of a transformative encounter with our God with love previously unknown, a hope found nowhere else, a grace and mercy we hadn't otherwise discovered. Each of us surely bears that mark. We began this morning with a custom most frequently kept on the Feast of the Epiphany, and so it was a sort of flashback of about 48 hours ago when we gathered on the 6th outside to burn greens and to mark the door. The custom is one in which we take chalk that was blessed to mark a blessing on our doors. We take ordinary, everyday substance and use it to tell a holy proclamation, both that this place and the people who gather here might continue to be made more fully into God's own image, and that in this very place, all who come here might find God dwelling. An outward symbol made with a simple tool we use to tell the world of a rather remarkable and transformative reality we seek to be and to live in this place. Today in our church's liturgical life is the first Sunday after that epiphany, which is also kept as an observance of the baptism of our Lord. We have the Paschal candle here to remind us of that. As we renew promises today, I hope you will also call to mind the words that are said in the baptism at that moment that we call the chrismation when the priest marks marks the baptized with oil for the sign of the cross on their forehead. You are sealed, we say. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Marked as Christ's own forever. Once again, an ordinary substance of oil used to proclaim a remarkable, breathtaking truth of our lives, that each of us is Christ's own each of us marked and sealed to carry that unshakable truth into every day of our lives. The Feast of the Epiphany and this season after it that we now enter is the end of a season some in the church call the Incarnation Cycle. Depending on who you ask, Advent begins this cycle when we ready our hearts for the Incarnation. Christmas, not just that one day celebration, but a 12 day feast centers us on this Incarnation, the truth and promise that God really was made flesh, that God really did take human form. And now the epiphany, the story of the Magi making their way to see this human God following a star, following a light. The season after it, teaching and telling us, inspiring us for how we are to live differently because of it. Besides these big feast days over the last several weeks, there are several smaller ones in the midst of this cycle that get missed. Though there are many, I'm thinking here, especially of the feast day of Thomas, so-called Doubting Thomas, which falls just before Christmas. You'll remember the story. We tell it every year on the first Sunday after Easter. He was the one who wanted to touch, to physically touch the marks of Jesus' side before he believed in the resurrected Christ before he believed that it was really Jesus. The 
The stories of this season tell us that what happens with our bodies, just as what happens with our hearts and souls, matters. Matters enough that God took on the very same form to know what breaks our hearts, what inflicts the pain, what causes the joy, and where we might stumble. And as Thomas well knows, God redeems and heals and brings new life to all. And so the marks of the stories of our lives matter. We are changed by them and can bring about change through them. There is, at least for me, a remarkable grace in the interplay of all of this. Of course, the truth of the matter is that the marks that we bear, whether on our physical bodies or on our hearts or in our very souls, often and sometimes, what they all certainly always tell a story. I think if we're able to be honest with ourselves, if you're able to go there today, you didn't know I was going to lead you to that place, but if you did, if you're able to get there, I think we might discover that some of these marks are not just what has been done to us, but are through some of the misgivings and missteps, even some of our better moments we have taken in our lives, these marks are now born as marks on the story of somebody else's life too. They have happened to us, and because we miss the mark too often in our lives, they have happened to others on our account. Of course, that isn't the whole story. That can't be the whole story. For though places of pain and shame are part of us, they are not the places from which we draw the eternal truth of who we are. You see, just as all that I mentioned before is part of that incarnation story and cycle, so too is the baptism of Jesus that we celebrate today. In that day, Jesus went to the River Jordan to be baptized by John, not thinking himself to be worthy to do the baptizing, nor thinking Jesus really needed to be repenting of the sin that John believed was so central to baptism. He hesitated. But Jesus insisted, and it must be done, and so John consents, we are told, and they make their way into the water. It was then, it was then just as they came up from that same water that the heavens opened and the very Spirit of God descended and a voice proclaimed, this is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. As one writer puts it, before Jesus proves to be the faithful Son of God by resisting the devil in the wilderness, before he begins to fulfill his messianic mission, God declares his unconditional love for him. Being God's beloved Son fun fundamentally defines Jesus. Jesus does not do God's work in order to earn God's love. Instead, divine love is what motivates and sustains Jesus' ministry of love to those who are hurting and those who will hurt him culminating even in his death on the cross. In the beginning, in the beginning, Jesus was named as beloved. In the beginning, before your very creation, at the source of your very creation, the inspiration for your very creation is God's same naming of you as beloved. You, me, we may all very well be marked and labeled with the myriad stories of our lives and the assumptions of those around us, but there is nothing. There is nothing that can separate us. There is nothing that can undo or remove us. There is nothing that can supplant or cover us up from this. Whether we are in the midst of heartbreak or grief, one of our best successes and highest accomplishments, or just making our way through life, God has declared God, God's unconditional love for you, just as he did for Jesus. And it is from this place that we live our lives. Being God's beloved is not just the truth of who we are, but the inspiration for all that we do. The good news promise of this day is that though all of the marks we carry surely tell the story of our lives, it is this one, the sign and seal of our identity as gods, that is the only eternal one, the only one that cannot be removed, the only one in which we take our whole identity. And as much as it is true, it is also a promise and a pledge to live our lives as if we really were Christ's own. Promises we will renew when instead of the Nicene Creed after this sermon, we stand to renew our baptismal vows. The promises we made are that were made for us to live our lives following the way of Jesus. Just as that is true, so we mark the very doors through which we enter this beloved space. 
that we all might know from these very walls and that all who come here might know from this very place, from the lives who gather here week by week and day by day, that the promise of being God's beloved is not just for us, but that it might be made known to all through us. Ordinary people marked with ordinary things to tell the world an extraordinary story of love and grace and hope. A story this world so desperately needs to hear, a story that takes its roots in the very God who became one of us, a story that is the only thing that can renew and transform and heal our lives and this world, a story that all begins with these words for you on this day and every day. You are my beloved, sealed and marked as Christ's own.